Seth Scoville and uh, Kim Scoville's husband um, went to school together at Stanford University. And um, I, from there I got my... Uh, Alright, let's try it, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got a mechanical engineering uh, undergraduate degree there, Bachelor's of Science, and I um, started at the end of that program, was called a, a co-op program at Johnson Space Center, which is basically where you are in school for a semester or a quarter, and then you come down and work at Johnson Space Center for a quarter, and then you go back there for a quarter, you go back and forth until you're done. Um, with that, I also did a uh, co-terminal master's degree in aerospace, in aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford as well. So I sort of delayed getting out of college because it was pretty fun, and also it was getting to go back and forth with Johnson and Vermont. So it was a great experience. Um, I can talk to people about that, and for as you know, those of you going to be getting out of high school and going to college at some point. There's some great opportunities there. I can tell you all about those. But let's focus on today. Um, from that, uh, that experience through college and, and the internship at Johnson, I got up, I was offered a full-time job here in 2000. Um, and at that time, I started a group that was the, uh, called the EVA operations group. Does anyone know what EVA is? Because I'm going to probably say that a lot. Extra right. Extra activity. Spacewalks. Okay, so if I say EVA, translate spacewalk. So I'll try to use a few acronyms, but likely I will slip into some. And if you're like, what the heck is that he's talking about? It's NASA translated to be for something very common and easy to say in English. <laughs> so let me know if, if, I, uh, if I'm confusing people. Um, so the group that I'm in is responsible for, um, it's, it's in a director called Mission Operations. And so at Johnson Space Center, it's broken up into an engineering director, which does a lot of the hardware design and building and certification. There's an operations group which does training of astronauts, writing and procedures, and then the flight control and execution of the mission. There's a crew office which goes and flies in space. Um, and there's a program office which sort of manages budgets and the mission requirements and so forth. So I'm in the mission operations group. And as I said, we do the, the training and flight control for missions. And basically what would happen is um, for a year and a half or so before a mission launches, uh, one of us in our group would get a you know, team of us would, would get assigned to a mission, and they'd say, "Okay, you're in charge of this mission, and you're going to teach them everything they need to know about how the spacesuit works and how the airlock works. And when they get up there, you're going to make sure that they have planned the activities on their timeline because they schedule every minute of every day for the crew when they're up there. They're going to make sure that they eat, sleep, check out the spacesuit, get their water bags filled, make sure they go to the potty, make sure they study the procedures, make sure they put all their tools together, make sure they." do a pre-breathe to get as much nitrogen out of their body, they'll get in the suit, they'll depress down the vacuum, they'll go out and build a space station, they'll come back inside and do it all over again in a day or two later. So that was um, sort of a pattern that I would go through developing these missions, and I got a flight control certification to sit on console in mission control to basically follow the crew as it's happening. They're executing the procedures we would write, we'd be able to look at the telemetry coming down, just the data coming down from the suit from the vehicle to say, yep, everything's working, or oh crap. This is breaking, and we've got to fix it now. So, and it happens a lot both ways. So you have to sort of be prepared. For both. Um, I went in a number of missions that way during the shuttle program, um, and then, for better or for worse, we built the space station. It was all built, and they said, "I don't really need to take the risk of flying the shuttle anymore because we've assembled the space station. It is a inherently risky vehicle, and it's, the cost of it is preventing us from doing other programs." And so they canceled the space shuttle. Program. So, did everyone get to see it yesterday? You never fly through? Yeah, yeah. How cool is that? Right it did. I heard it went like right over Westheimer uh, yeah, yesterday morning. Like, like, so cool. That's awesome. So I've got um, I've got some, a few artifacts from Space Shuttle I'll be able to share with you guys too. But, um, so Space Shuttle comes to an end and we're sort of in the business of maintaining the space station in, in the Earth orbit. Um, it's amazing how many times that I'll go out and talk to people. How many people know there's a space station there? Yeah, you guys are, are so much smarter than the mass, the mass majority of the people out there. It's amazing how many people have no idea that there's a, a space station there. I think NASA's over. Um, there are six people living up there right now. As we speak. Actually, three, because you know, three guys just came home before saying anything. Um, yeah, pretty much constantly. There's, uh, there's six people living up there, living and working for about six months at a time. You can go online and see when you're going to be able to see the space station fly overhead. Um, and... Uh, in that, in that, so anyway, as um, time went on, I sort of got to be the manager of the group that does the, the training. Let's get into a little bit about the spacesuits and the airlock and what goes 
on with, with NASA. That's where my specialty. If you have questions about how the potty works, I can do my best. If you have questions about the Mars rover, I can do my best, but I'm not the expert, I'll tell you that right now. I'll, I'll fake it. Um, all right, so we're going to do a little bit of a history about the spacesuits and where they came from and how these were evolved over time. I was supposed to spend two minutes on the slide, or 30 seconds on the slide. How do you do all right, why do we need a spacesuit? Why, why in a vacuum? Why do you, why do you need a vacuum? You can't breathe. Okay, so you need, you need oxygen to breathe. What else? Pressure. Right. You can work without gravity. Um, it's actually you know, a pretty awesome experience. You can float around. But you have to have the pressure in your body. If you don't have the pressure, the, the pressure within your body expands with the decompression. You can you know, oil your blood. You, you don't live very long. And it doesn't work out so well for you. So um, decompression sickness becomes a major concern. Keeping you alive is pressure, breathing oxygen, what else? Water to water to drink. Um, you're going to be out there for a six and a half, seven hour EVA. You're going to spend an hour or two before that getting into the suit. You're going to spend nine hours in a suit. You better have something to drink. What else? Any other ideas? Temperature. Good one. All right, so negative 250 degrees to 250, plus 250 degrees is the uh, kind of temperatures extremes you can get on a space station. So stick your hand in the oven, grab that oven rack when it's uh, cooking your turkey, and that's what this suit has to protect you from. Um, there's some other ones. Um, our, our atmosphere provides a lot of radiation protection from us, um, so this suit provides some radiation protection. Also, uh, a lot of meteorite protection, so low micrometeorites traveling 17,000 miles an hour or faster hits this suit, it's like shooting with a BB gun, that is also supposed to maintain your pressure in the suit that day. Um, so we need to figure out a way to protect from, from, from rocks and very fast moving bullets from, from popping the suit. Um, and if you're on the moon, there's dust everywhere, dust and bearings and seals causes those to degrade. So of course we have to protect uh, from dust mitigation. If you were to bring dust inside your uh, lunar lander or your lunar habitat, you've got um, inhalation concerns, you've got exposure concerns, and so there's a lot of a lot of things that this suit is doing for you. So see if my name is hit. Temperature extremes, oxygen, pressure, you guys did good. Micromedia incorporated three. Protection from dust and rocks. Okay, we hit those. Okay, so the space it has evolved over time. This has been a constantly changing um, engineering project. Um, you never envision the, the ideal solution and go straight to that. It is something you always tinker with and, and um, come up with an initial concept probably based on something that they did in the military, flying high altitude jets maybe. Maybe if we throw that up there in space so that works. And then as mission requirements change, you have to change your space suit. You have to make it better and you learn how to do things better. You know, if you have one suit design which may hurt someone and you have to figure out, okay, how can we modify that, tinker with it here and there. So it doesn't work. And then we end up with what is you know, our current state of the art but that's you know, 1980s technology. So um, this sort of shows sort of the progression of space and I'll sort of talk through those here. So Mercury, uh, Project Mercury was uh, basically had the space suit that was designed based on a Mark IV uh, Navy pressure suit. And uh, what they would do is basically commanders would get in this, they'd be looking at short duration missions, suborbital flights initially, and then going to uh, orbital flights that we are talking from minutes to hours to days, short days. Um, and so basically you have the crew launching in this suit, staying in the suit on orbit, landing in the suit, so you better be comfortable. Um, but it's not really designed to go out on a spacewalk. It's not designed to, to do that very well. It can protect you. If, you're, uh, if your capsule loses pressure, it'll keep you alive, and that's what it's designed to do. Um, Gemini, um, they sort of expanded the mission goals there. They said, okay, we're not we're going to go beyond just trying to get a person up into, into suborbital flight in orbit. We're going to get them to stay up there. We want to have two crew members on there. We want to expand the capability of this capsule. We want to build um, more capabilities that we will eventually need to be able to go to the moon. So they said, okay, we, if we're going to go to the moon, we need to be able to rendezvous. We need to be able to send up. And who knows what rendezvous is? Checkpoint. Uh, not exactly. Two spaceships meet in the air. Exactly. There you go. Right. So you have. Um, when you go out to the moon, you're going to send down a lunar lander, and you're going to have a command module circling around the moon. You hope that they can meet up again when they uh, when they come back up to, to meet each other. So 
Ronnie, but that's a critical skill you have to be able to have. Um, you have to be able to do spacewalks. Not much sense in going to the moon if you can't do a spacewalk. If your vehicle breaks while you're out there, you hope you can fix it. Um, all reasons you need to have um, these different design technology demonstrations that you have during the Gemini mission. Most of long duration flight. You don't want to, well, what was then considered long duration flight. From going from, you know, hours to, you know, short numbers of days to long duration 17 day missions, you need to be able to learn how to keep the crew alive that long in orbit. Back at this time, it, it sort of, we sort of laugh at what they thought might happen. They thought when you got up into zero gravity, your heart would explode, you wouldn't be able to swallow, you wouldn't be able to keep food down, your bladder wouldn't work. You basically <coughs> So some of those initial tests had very, what we would consider now basic objectives, but that was largely driving what we thought were some of the major you know, issues that we didn't know if we could get it over. We did. Um, Apollo spacesuits. So these were the first suits that they that they designed basically from scratch, and they had um, a, a greater uh, purpose than just sort of being in the vehicle and doing short short EVAs. So um, let's see if go. These suits, you have the pressure vessel, the pressure suit that the crew is wearing, but they all had a hose. That hose was providing um, oxygen, cooling, communication data, um, and it, it was entirely dependent upon the life support system of the vehicle. Um, you couldn't um, can disconnect yourself from the vehicle. And the, um, so with Apollo, uh, they needed to be able to say, we're going to go land on the moon, and I don't want to just stay on the rope next to the, next to the lunar lander. I need to go out and find rocks. I need to drive my buggy. I need to take jumps. I need to you know, put up uh, seismic instruments. I need to take core samples. I need to get farther away from here. So I need to build myself a life support system that is self-contained and travels with me. So from that, you, get, you can see in the back here a backpack. It's called the PLIS, or Primary Life Support Subsystem. And with that, that contains all of the functionality that you were getting from the umbilical and from the vehicle before. So it has oxygen tanks in it, it has its own cooling system, it has um, communication systems in it, uh, it has pressure systems in it, uh, emergency systems in it. Um, if, if your primary system was failed, you also have to consider the design process for this. Not only what is the, the first system that needs to work, my, my first gas tank, but what if that one fails? What if the regulators to work. What if it gets a hole in it? I need to have a, a backup system, any critical life support system. I need to have a redundant system so that I can turn on and at least get myself inside and save my life. So, present spacesuits, I sort of use quotation marks there because um, the extravehicular mobility unit is the spacesuit we have now. This too has been evolving since this was designed originally for, um, for shuttle back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, first, first use of it was on STS-6, um, and this too had a um, portable, portable life support system. Actually, this is a better example. I'll walk over here. This is an EMU, an extracurricular mobility unit spacesuit. So here's a plist in the back. Contains your oxygen, your water, um, and so forth. Has pressure systems in here. We'll get into this. Um, that are within the bladder that retain all the pressure. Um, one thing you might uh, that, that you sort of have to think about if you're going to pressurize something to keep you alive. You do that to a balloon, the balloon's going to expand. You have to have some way to, to keep the balloon from expanding too much. So you put restraint on it to keep it from blowing up too much. Um, you've got the cooling systems in it, you've got communications, um, electronics, data systems all built in, in there. You've got um, different visors that you can put onto it that provide um, shielding from the sun, so if you like putting in your sunglasses, you can rotate that knob down. Um, the other thing that was sort of unique about um, some of these suits is that when we got into the uh, Apollo and, and really into the, into the current EMU based suit, we stopped building suits individually for every crew member. So back in Mercury, uh, John Glenn got his own space suit. They measured every bit of him and said, okay, we're going to build this just for John Glenn. Um, now what they do is, yeah, they still measure you, and they, and they will um, ad nauseum measure every little inch of your body. And then they'll say, okay, they stick it into this algorithm that says, this is the suit match that you want. So we have six different sizes of arms. We have three different sizes of, of upper torso. This is called the hard upper torso. You have one size of helmet, but uh, that works. You have all different kinds of combinations of the legs. You can change out these arms to get different sizes, but even within these arms, 
They have little cam buckles in there that you can turn and adjust, and that will give you a little quarter inch here. Within these fingers, I'll show you this later, you can adjust sixteenths of an inch by just sort of moving a little slip knot. We're talking about pretty precise measurements you can get to get this thing to fit you very, very uh, effectively. And what are some of the reasons for that? Why would you want to have a, a well-suited fitted suit? Because not everyone does. Is going to be in it for a while? Excuse me? Are they going to be in the suit for a long time? If you're going to be in a suit for a long time, you don't want to have hot spots and a lot of chafing. Absolutely. Um, the Orlans, the Russians, they have basically two sizes of suit. Um, so they can do a couple things. They can say, we can select crew members that are this size. Or they can stick you in there and say, good luck. Um, <laughs> no, but what we need to do, what, if you look at the work it took to assemble a space station, there were hand-intensive tasks. You can imagine building your house with ski mitts and ski gloves on, and trying to do electrical wiring with ski mitts on, if you're trying to hammer um, with those on, and oh, by the way, if you hit your thumb, you can pop your, your life support system. Um, so you really, so fine dexterity control is really critical um, to be able to, to be effective and efficient. Um, there's also uh, these orange suits, are called ACES suits, that's uh, Advanced Crew Escape Systems. These were, were developed after Challenger. Um, prior to Challenger and the shuttle, crews would, would launch basically in short sleeve environments. They'd have a, an oxygen helmet on, but they didn't have any sort of um, rescue Hardware. So this suit allowed them the ability to, in the event of a ascent or, or reentry um, failure, contingency, they would be able to bail out, and this would protect their lives. Um, so let's talk about that one a little bit. This one was designed from a, from an Air Force pressure suit. The orange is sort of um, is a color for search and rescue. If you if you're floating in the middle of the ocean, this sort of the international symbol of health and belief. Um it has built into it a parachute, it has an automatic life raft, it has signaling equipment, it has motion sickness pills built into it, it has, um, uh, it has, it is its own pressure suit as well, so that if the space shuttle were to loop prep, lose pressure, it would keep pressure on you um, if, it, if, it, if that happened. It has its own comm systems. It doesn't have a pliss though, right? Um, because they didn't need to, they would, when they got on the, the flight deck of the space shuttle, they'd plug it into a little oxygen port and they'd get oxygen. Um, and it has cooling, it has some cooling um, that it would get from the vehicle. And it has a small little um, oxygen bottle that gives you about 10 minutes of, of emergency oxygen. But the idea is to get you out of the vehicle, keep you alive, keep you alive when you hit the ground or the water, and make it so someone can find you and can survive. If you guys have any questions along the way, stop. Like, please interrupt. I'm, I'm looking at you expecting any of your questions, so don't hesitate. Yeah? So for those, were those only, like, if that's what they were wearing, you know, they would, they would use it for ascent, and then once they get up into orbit, um, they take those suits off, and then they just go short sleeve. Um, you know, and then prior to re-entry, they'd suit up in these, um, re-enter the atmosphere, and then they come out and get up. And they're not, they're not great suits to sit in for, for longer than you need to. What's that? Yeah, so, zero gravity, let's talk about that for a second. Um, is there gravity in space? No. Okay, so so why did, why does the moon stay around the Earth? Why does the Earth stay around? Well, no, no. Okay, so we, we're in space. Um, so there's still this is this is a, a good concept to get. It's sort of key to what to to what we get in orbit. Um, a lot of times we'll talk about zero gravity. That's a really bad term for what it, for what we experience up there. It's zero relative gravity, is, um, or it's basically balanced forces. So, if you were to just put yourself up in space, um, where the space station is, and let yourself go, you would fall right down here. What you need to do is you need to push yourself horizontally around the Earth, so you're moving around the Earth really fast, every 90 minutes. And then what that does for you is, as the curvature of the Earth starts to fall away from you, you're falling towards the Earth just at the same speed. So if you imagine I'm up on top of on the North Pole and I throw a baseball, and I've got, got a good arm, I can throw it 100 feet maybe, I don't know. And it goes, and I go and exercise, and I throw it a little bit faster, and it goes a little bit farther, and I get, I go to the gym, and I really work out, and I throw it really fast, I throw it 17,000 miles an hour. And it goes around the Earth, 
and comes back. Yes, but there's drag, there's, so the, the atmosphere will slow it down. But if you get it up above the atmosphere and you do that, I'm really tall. And you can throw 70,000 miles an hour and it'll just go right around and come back. Um, and so there's still gravity there. It is still what is keeping us going in that circle, but we're not, it's all relative gravity because the, the fall down and, and motion is, is balanced out. So it's basically a constant state of free fall. So uh, back to the other question. You're doing all this in zero in, in zero gravity. So yes, once you once you get up into space and you've done the acid support, you're getting out of the suit in zero gravity. You're getting into it in zero gravity. And there's lots of tools we have to help you do that. Uh, okay, uh, next grade from a voting unit. Let's get into this a little bit. We talked about it a little a little bit so far, but um, it's designed for low Earth orbit. It's not designed for the lunar surface. Um, it, it, it's heavy. It's about Outfitted is about 280 pounds um, to contain that, that life support system on the back and the batteries and so forth. Um, it's got the modular design. I talked about that, how you can sort of change out the parts to fit the people you want. Talked about its protection systems. And as I said, this was originally built for, for a space shuttle when they go up and do a two week mission. Um, and it, we sort of put more requirements on this over the years. When the space station came along, we needed to launch these spacesuits up there. And they need to be able to live for two years, three years. And what we found, these, these hardware, this hardware that was designed for a two-week mission, doesn't do so well when, you, when it sits around for two years. If you had a car and you parked in your garage for two years, I bet you'd have gas separation, you'd have corrosion of some of the parts, you'd have belts that would be losing tension, your oil wouldn't be well mixed. And same thing happens here. Um, and so there's um, a lot that has to be done both in the Evolving design of the spacesuit, but also the maintenance that we need for it. Um, so, to leave the spacesuits up there, we have to learn how to maintain them, how to check them out, how to you know, clean the parts, how to make sure that the water that's sitting in, in there in them doesn't get full of bugs and, uh, and different, uh, when I say bugs, I mean like uh, microbial growth and so forth. Um, we have to make sure that the oil, the, the grease, the lubricants, and the fans and pumps get mixed up. So. So let's talk about what makes up the spacesuit here. And I'm going to sort of walk through stuff. When we get to the end, I don't know what, how I know you guys have some time tonight. I was going to, I was told, Alan told me I had about an hour, but I'm probably going to go a little bit long. I, you can, if you need to, people need to leave earlier, that's fine. We'll just be playing with stuff. So let's talk about what's inside the spacesuit. So um, we talked about how to keep someone cool. There's a couple of parts of this. One is how do you keep the astronaut inside at a comfortable temperature while they're, you know, working um, to a simple space station. And then also they're touching, you know, hot pieces of metal that have been sitting out in the sun for uh, 10 years, and they have to keep those, you know, keep them um, from burning when they touch those. So keeping the astronaut cool, this was something that was designed um, originally back in the early suits we talked about for a, for a call for a Mercury and Gemini. They just took cold air or cold oxygen, they just flushed that over the member's body, and that was providing some. They started to figure out, they started to design the Apollo suits that that wasn't enough. And so they designed this suit. This is called a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. Um, and basically, what it is? How many uh, how many ladies have a chiffon dress ever? Does anyone have a chiffon dress? Okay, so your chiffon dress is the same material that is in the inside of of these suits, and it's basically just meant to be comfortable against your skin. It feels pretty smooth. You can slip into it pretty well. But the real reason for this uh, suit is it's got a spandex outer layer. But if you come and look at it, it's got these little tubes that are about an eighth, eighth inch thick, and it's about 300 feet of tubing wrapped throughout of it. What do you think, what's that, what's that all about? Why would you put a bunch of tubes through this? Yeah, why, why would you want to push water through that? Why is that better than throwing a bunch of cold air over your head? You can reuse it. Okay. You can, well, you could have a fan that could circulate the oxygen around so you can keep reusing that too. So yeah, you have to take the heat away. So the water is a much is much better thermally at taking the heat away than just gas. Um, the specific heat is such that you're going to get a lot more heat transfer into this water than you're going to get into the gas. So as you're wearing this, you have cold water that's been chilled on an ice block in the back of the life support system. It gets circulated through these tubes. It comes in, goes down all over your body, comes out. You've warmed it up a little bit. It goes back in the suit. And goes and it's going to circulate around the electronics and the computers in the suit to cool them down. 
and now you got warm water. And it's going to go out by that ice block again, cool off again, come back and go through that circuit again. So it'll just keep circulating that water through there doing that function. But this was this was sort of an innovation that sort of made that possible to be able to have those heat loads that you need to have. This is actually an interesting sort of spin-off. There's, I don't know the name of the, of the condition, but there's, there was um, some childhood conditioner who couldn't sweat. And so this kid had never been outside before because if he goes outside, he would overheat. His skin just didn't want to sweat. And so NASA built him one of these. And for the first time in his life, he was able to walk outside and, and you know, play outside on the grass. So, kind of a cool story. Um, Comcat. This is amazing. Okay. This is, um, this is a communications carrier assembly. What this does is it has um, redundant earphones for each ear, and then it has noise canceling microphones, two of them on each side of your mouth. And if you look back, this design has not changed much. There's Neil Armstrong, and there's, here's basically the same current version that we're using now. Um, it hasn't changed. You know, actually interesting, Kim's grandfather was a World War II pilot, and uh, a couple years ago we were going through his garage, or uh, your uncle looked around and pulled out an old um, World War II helmet that he, or uh, headset that he had, and it looked almost exactly like this. I was like, this is a World War II helmet that we're using on the space station now, and it basically has the exact same design. It's an aviator style headset. It has little um, deer skin earmuffs you can adjust, and they come in different sizes. If you've got a um, broader face, you can have longer microphone booms and so forth. And that's giving you comps so you can talk to your partner who's out there on a spacewalk with you, you can talk to Houston on the ground. Um, there's also a caution and warning computer in the suit. This has different sensors throughout the suit that make sure it's working right, make sure it's at the right pressure, make sure you've got enough gas in your tank, make sure that, um, do you have a question? Okay. Make sure that, that basically the suit's functioning correctly, make sure the fan's at the right speed and so forth. If anything sort of slips out of parameters, it sends a, a tone to your your ear that will tell you what's going on. You want to give me a call? I don't know. has a cell phone. You can give me a call and you can hear what that tone sounds like. Oh. Um, so that's a problem. Okay. All right. Um, and getting sort of the, the subcomponents here. We talked about um, how the suit's modular. So sort of you can break it down. Let's sort of show you how this works. So, when it's all said and done, here's the end product of a glove. It's got a, a wrist disconnect which plugs into the arm socket, and there's a pressure seal within there that maintains pressure. It's got a it's got a rotating bearing so that you can turn your hands and give you the flexibility and mobility there. But getting to this point is a long sort of built-up process. Um, and this is probably the most, the aspect of the suit that has changed the most in the continuously try to evolve this part to make it better because this is really hard to get right. So at this point, um, the current design, what they do is a new astronaut will go in and they'll take a laser scan of his hand and then from that they'll build a CAD model um, from his hand and then they'll have a mold that is built. Um, and that mold will then print out or, or will form a um, polyurethane bladder and this is providing the, the um, pressure bladder for the suit. That then gets put into the restraint layer. This is the part that's preventing the suit from expanding. If you, if you were to try to stick your hand inside a balloon and not try to grab a tool, as I said, it doesn't work. So you have to be able to sort of keep it from expanding too much. And so this is um, a restraint layer that's put on there. And you can see all these little strings and, and loops on the side. That's what I was talking about, how you can adjust the length of each of these fingers to sort of tailor it to your own specific size. And you can make it so that so you're, you know, if you have a super long pinky, that one um, <laughs> won't stick out too much. Other little features you have in here was called a palm bar. Here's a little strap you can reach in the back of the suit, pull this tight, and right along here, people can feel this later on, there's a little metal plate that goes right in there and, and um, another one right here. And that keeps that part pressed in so you can grab something on that surface. Um, that then get, has an outer layer. Um, this is called TMG, or, or Thermal Micrometeor Garment. Um, this is basically just a, um, a Kevlar ortho fabric. It's got RTV, which is a uh, room temperature vulcanizer, it's basically rubber, um, which is um, impregnated onto the top surface. It provides uh, tactile grip. Underneath there, you have this um, the uh, what's called a turtle skin 
so like a Vectran fabric that's like a tight Kevlar weave or so that just prevents it from ripping. It's a ripstop protection. Also, why white? Flex heat, yeah, flex heat and radiation. Um, so that, that's what functionality this is all providing. There's also a little cable coming off here. Any guesses what that might be for? Pressure. Uh, pressure. So the pressure's coming because you have, this is connected to the suit, it's pumping oxygen in with a, with a pump into there. So that's just going to the whole, whole sleeve of it. So this is electrical, maybe a hint there. Why would you want electrical? Heat. Yeah, we've got a little, little um, thermistor uh, or uh, resistive heating elements in all the fingertips. You can turn on a little switch here that will uh, activate those heaters or turn them off so that when you're touching something really cold, you put it all together and you get this over here. Those are gloves. Um, so, it's all, it all ends up being, you know, one glove for each hand, but within that there's three different layers on, on the glove. You've got the, the bladder layer, the restraint layer, and then the outer orthofabric layer. Each of them has, has sort of those different purposes. Um, now that's sort of the area where we have the fewest number of layers, because on those layers you're trying to minimize the amount of stuff you have there so you can have the best um, tactile control and feedback. Um, in the other places, we have to put a lot more. So right here, I have sort of, if you were to go and cut a section off that suit, this is sort of the different layer of makeup that you have. So there's that chiffon layer that we were talking about earlier that was on your, on your dress. Um, which is that. Or this is the spandex layer that has the tubing in it. Um, and this is a uh, neoprene coated Nylon, and it's uh, it's got you can sort of feel it's sort of rubbery. Right? This is what your what your pressure vessel is. And they have that through the entire suit there. Top of that is the keeping the balloon from expanding, the restraint. Right. Then um, this is neoprene. Why would you want neoprene? Remember I talked about the uh, the BB gun, the meteorites out there. So. What they did is, in, in uh, White Sands, New Mexico, they have this um, hypervelocity uh, uh, high impact um, test where they can shoot these little pellets at 18,000 miles an hour and they'll take a sample of this and they'll shoot it and they'll say, okay, where does it stop? And they would put in different materials there to figure out what was absorbing that kinetic energy and protecting it from getting down to that, that pressurized layer, which is really the, the bad day. Um, so you got that. And then above, the neoprene, you have all these things here. Any idea what they may be? It's heat. Yeah, why wouldn't you put like a whole bunch of down or something like that? You know, if we were here, if we were going to go to. Yeah. It's not going to take too much space. It would take too much space. It traps the air. Right. So let's, uh, let's think about where this is. So. That tra traps air, yeah. and if you're working out from the inside out of the suit, this is your pressure layer. So all the oxygen is on this side of the suit. So out here, we're in the back. There's no air to trap. That's not, you know, you could, you could have all the foam or down or uh, whatever you want to get from REI and put it there, and it would be absolutely no good because you're in the back. So the conduction, or that's right, the convection is really not a player for the heat transfer because there's, there's no gas molecules to, to transmit the heat. So really what you're looking at is your major player is radiation. And so to help with the radiation, you put all these different layers in there. And there's this little scrim, if you come, I don't know if you were able to look at this, there's a scrim that's put into each of these layers to sort of hold them separated so they each act sort of independently in that radiative heat transfer model. And then the top one is that orthofabric we talked about, same as the gloves with the Kevlar in it to, to prevent ripping and, All right, so that's the TMG. Basically, the, the similar parts come down to, to boots. There's two different sizes of boots. I sound like a text. I'm from Vermont, and I say boots. I'm like, oh my god, stop it. Um, so it's kind of a misnomer, too. I talk about zero G being a misnomer. Spacewalk is really a misnomer, too. We don't do much walking in space. 
Um, it's all really hand over hand. If you want to go someplace, you're going like this. Um, because without the, without the gravity, you know, you, your feet aren't staying on the ground. If you touch the ground, you're floating on. Um, and so really this, is, this doesn't have to give you a, much, a, lot, of, a lot of control there. Um, what it does need to do, and I'll have a picture of this later on, there's what's called a foot restraint, which is sort of, the closest analogy would be like a ski binding, where you can put your foot in and sort of lock it in, it's got a little heel clip back there. And that will allow you to keep your feet secure, keep them from going place, now you can let go with your hands and you can do work with two hands. Um, other parts of the suit, we get the bigger parts of the suit over here. Pants, lower torso assembly. This, you can see there's there's your yellow bladder. What's that? What? What is that? Yellow key? Yellow key? Oh, I thought that was Kendo. Oh, no. Yeah, no, they, they have like serial numbers in here because they sort of track all the serial numbers and which ones. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see here's, here's all the bladder material we have in there and all the layers go from there out. Um, and so, you know, we talked about you know, how you get in a suit after you put on your your LCBG, the cooling garment there. There's another layer you put on there that's, that's just like a, a cotton um, uh, undergarment that you put on underneath that as well. You put on a diaper because you're going to be in there for nine hours. Um, and then you sort of climb into this and you pull this up, get that up around your waist. And then the really fun part, and this is, um, this is a challenge. You go down underneath here, and you push your arms up through there, and it's sort of the analogy, it almost looks like someone giving birth, if you can imagine. If you're, doing you're coming out through here, and it, you've got to sort of do this type of thing, and get your arms up in there, and then pull yourself out. How can you think that the human body isn't designed to go through that kind of orifice and hole, and get up in there? And it's not, we heard a lot of astronauts this way. This is actually one of the number one um, problems with this suit, is that there's a lot of rotator cuff injuries that happen for, for astronauts because muscles on their shoulder get ripped as they try to go up and out of there and then they have to go through surgery and get repaired. So, issues with this design, it's definitely, as I said, an evolving design. Um, so that's how you get in, you, you put the helmet on, you connect the gloves, and you make sure everything's passing up the video. Well, yeah, so the, yeah, this is this is the current design, that's how it, how it works. It's still, uh, still in your, it's not like a laceration cut. It's, um, you know, if you were to to put a, a heavy load on your arm, it takes a, a lot of force on a pretty small muscle that doesn't have a lot of mechanical advantage there. And it can, it can tear, it tears the muscle. Um, so there's alterations to like the life support system that are going on pretty continuously. Some of them are little minor things, like they may, Add a captive lock feature to a fastener, or they may make, or they may change out at different times. So that on orbit or break, you could replace it easier. They change some of the software on the, on it um, regularly. They might change um, the heating circuit to go to the gloves. They've done that. They uh, come up with uh, new designs for the battery that goes in the back as, as battery technology evolves. Um, the, the lithium ion capability that's in all your cell phones is actually more advanced than what we had for a while, so recently we just upgraded to lithium ion cell technology. Um, you get robotics guys, you guys must know about the advantage of lithium ion and the energy density there. So you put that in the suit. So there's things like that that evolve, but in terms of functional change in, in that aspect of the, the shape of the hard upper torso and pants, that's pretty much been what it's been um, since about 2002. Um, and the reason is it's expensive. These are enormously complex to Redesign at that component level and rebuild and recertify. It's, a, it's sort of the type of thing where the, the cost wasn't sort of justified by the benefit of being up. Now, when a mission changes, if you're going to go to the moon or Mars or an asteroid, all that's going to change because this suit doesn't doesn't function there. We have to redesign. But for the space station, for shuttle, it does its job. It does its job well. What's that? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. But. Yeah, you know, that's a good question though. I mean, we can sort of talk about you know the cost of, of the suit and cost of the hardware. How much you know if uh, the entire US budget was was one dollar, 
how much how many, how much uh, of that one dollar would go to NASA, all of NASA? It's like so it's 0.6 percent. So, um, and that's not human spaceflight. That's all of NASA's. That's the Mars rover. That's aviation research. I got a Trident. That's um, Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Uh, unmanned satellites, that's all the International Space Station, that's development of new rockets to go beyond low Earth orbit, um, that's me coming here and talking to you today, that's building a suit, it's maintaining flight controllers, it's um, all that all that stuff, so I think it's a bargain. Um, it's a flight control module, okay. So this is sort of the, the crew's interface with the suit when they go outside. Um, so Star Wars fans here? Come on, everyone. In, come on, this is this the engineering team. Come on. Everyone's Star Wars fans. Um, so Darth Vader has in front of him, all, you know, the in Luke Star Wars and the, the X-Men player, they all have the sort of module in front of them with all those weird outdated 1970s boxes and switches. Right? So that's what this is. What this does is this gives you control of the light support system and control of the software and the pressure modes in the suit. So, you have on the top here a, a rotating knob that lets you control um, your radios and power those on. You've got a little, um, this is called a purge valve here. If you want to get the gas out of the suit, you can open up that and basically this, the gas will run out and uh, depressurize the suit so you can get out of it easier. You've got fan switches, you've got a power switch. When you're inside the airlock, you don't want to be using all your, your resources here. So we'll have an umbilical that connects to the suit there as well and you'll get calm and oxygen cooling from that so you can sort of preserve the suit's resources from when you get outside. That, would, that sort of connects right on there. Um, so you've got um, uh, frequency selector switches so you can change frequencies on the suit. You've got a fan switch to turn in on and off. Down here you've got, um, this is called an O2 actuator. This lets you select different pressures within that suit so it has a variable regulator within the suit. I didn't really talk about this earlier, but um, we talk about how the pressure is needed, needed within the suit. At different stages of a spacewalk, you want to have different pressures within the suit. When you're first um, sitting around in, inside the space station, you're getting into the suit and checking it out. You still kind of don't need a lot of extra pressure because you've already got the pressure of the space station. So you want to have a lower pressure, which lets you move easier. Um, it provides more mobility. Um, when you go down and depress the airlock to vacuum, you need a lot more. You need more pressure to keep you alive, but that extra pressure is going to be harder to fight. Uh, this is what makes the suit suit stiffer. Um, so you can select the different modes there. There's also a, another mode, EVA, and this one keeps the same pressure the, as if you were in this press mode. But what it does is it says, if anything goes wrong, turn on my secondary emergency pack back here to, to, to save my life. Um, so there's some different modes there. Anyone notice anything weird about? Yeah, when you're in here, you cannot see what's going on there at all. You can, crewers get pretty good. They, they train enough that they can feel it. They know it pretty well by feel. But um, what they'll do is they have a mirror, just sort of polished steel mirror. And they'll hold it there and they'll say, ah, I'm an EVA. Um, this is a, a temperature control valve. This is like, a, like the faucet on your kitchen sink. And so, you don't always want as much blasting cold water going through that garment as you can possibly get because it is also negative 250 degrees out there in some places. And so in some cases you want, you want the water to heat up. And so what this does, this is sort of a mixing valve bus you control. Give me as much cold water as I can get or stop with the cold water and just let this water sit here and, and stew and warm up a bit. Stew. I get for <laughs> We're gonna watch a little bit here. The sound is working. Uh, it should be. Yes. All right. So this is um, Apollo 16, uh, Charlie Duke, um, on the surface of the moon. And I want you guys, when you watch this, sort of make some observations about how suit design affects um, what goes on right here. This is a core sample. He's trying to get a core sample of the, of the lunar surface.
performing these myself, I was talking to someone who has, and he's saying that it's really incredible how much mobility you get. You think that you'd be pretty constrained, but the, but the degrees of freedom you get with each joint provide pretty good flexibility. A lot of, actually, a lot of the places where um, they use things like that are in, in, in deep, deep sea, um, like oil, uh, oil well uh, recoveries from Paris and so forth. They have a suit that I can go down and Sort of like the James Bond guy with the pinchers and stuff like that, but they actually tested some of them in, uh, in the Neutral Voice Lab, the swimming pool at, at Johnson Space Center. We got a chance to look at it. But it's amazing how much mobility they will get out of this thing, but it, those can take a lot higher pressure because it's really you know, hard aluminum or fiberglass shell versus a softer fabric. Um, you know, they sort of evolve things like you know, the shape of these shoulders so that it's more, um, it's going to cause less strain on the shoulder joint there. They work on that. Um, I was talking before about how you're trying to squeeze up into this suit. Um, they have a rear entry suit here, so you sort of sit into the back and sort of go in like this and close the hatch behind you. The Russians use this concept, actually, in their suit, the, the Orlan space suit. And getting in and out of it is a piece of cake. It's a snap. You just sit into it, close the door, and you're, and you're good to go. Um, they adjusted, like, the mobility within the visor here. So a lot of things you guys mentioned, some of the challenges are sort of addressed. And so, <laughs> so you just sort of need to have a mission to some place where we can, where we can use them. Um, a lot of these tests you can be done, they have a, a rock pile outside at JSC where we sort of simulate geological missions. There's also been missions where if we go to um, uh, volcanic flats in Arizona and they would set up um, uh, mock missions where they would have geologists come up with a simulated um, area of the Arizona desert that might simulate part of Mars or so forth. And we'd have a, a rover vehicle that would come out there and, and <coughs> like a, a Martian rover or so forth, and we'd have them do a, a two-week mission where they would have to live inside this rover. Anytime they got out of the rover, they'd put on a space to go do that. They'd have to collect rock samples and sort of bring the data back down to uh, talk mission control and so forth. So,